Swing and a high drive in the center field. Hits at the wall. It is gone. Passes does it again. Again. It's gone. It's into the bullpen. This game is tied. This game is tied. He swings and rips one to center field. It's high. It's deep. It's back. It's gone. Sale winds. He fires. Swing and a miss. Right play. It's over. The Red Sox have won. Welcome back to Play Tessie. It is episode 69. If you're listening on Drop Day, it's May 3rd. Episode 69. Nobody. There is nobody. Zero players in Red Sox history have ever worn that number, which is not nice. You want to wear 69 in Boston, though? You really want that crowd to be (laughs) making those at you? Yes. I I think yes. I think someone's got to do it. Yeah. Someone someone interesting has to break that barrier. I kind of wish it was barrier. I kind of wish it was Tristan. <laughs> There's like a few guys that I could like, I could have pictured Doogie being like, okay, screw it. Like I just got traded for Mookie bets. Like it's already as whatever. I'll just be 69 and like win over that portion of the fan base. Yeah. And then even guys like Julian Tavares, like there's been some weird guys. Ooh, Alfredo Aceves. Yeah. Ah, Aceves. I see what you did there. Um, yeah. This is the official podcast of Waldo being unfindable. If you know, you know. If you don't know, Tyler Hero. Peace, bro. Peace. Laters. Have a good off season. Have a good off season. You'll probably be in trade rumors again. It's all right. Oh yeah, here he is. Oh God, look at that outfit. Yeah, he could not be found during Game Five. He is. He's garbo. No, he was found. He was just he was he was found on uh the defense event where everyone was going after him and made every basket so much easier for the Celtics. There there's enough of a neck hole there to be a Siamese twin. It's true. He looks like a mixture of Waldo and a sailor a sailor. Like that looks like a sailor's hat with like stitching. He could go sailing in the nineteen sixties and fit in, if I will say if I would say. Yeah. Yeah. This is I feel like a colorized version of Popeye. (laughs) Minus <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and then he, Popeye, but skinny and bad at basketball. Yeah. And then you got Bam. He's just like, why uh, am I sitting next to this guy who dressed like that? Yeah. Bam. Bam's Bam's the normal one here. Bam. Bam did try to kill Al Horford, but his efforts were unsuccessful. This is also the official Red Sox podcast of WEI. I'm here with Pat. I'm here with Joe Braverman, who's been producing for us. Sammy's not with us today. So you got the three of us here. Before we get going, before we talk about this Red Sox series with the Giants in which they took two out of three games and they continue to look like a good baseball team, remember, hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening. Apple, Spotify, Odyssey app. Subscribe there. Rate us five stars. Go to the YouTube page. We're on WEI's YouTube page. We've got a playlist there. Hit the subscribe button for WEI as well and hit the thumbs up on our videos. Helps us out a ton. We're going to get right into this thing. Before that, though, forgot for a second. Follow us on the socials at Play Tessie on Twitter and Instagram. We've had tons of awesome content coming out on those accounts every single day. Seriously, new videos dropping every day with current Red Sox players, with the Red Sox stars of the future. We have made multiple, like the Sammy and I went to Portland. Pat went to Connecticut. We met all of the top prospects on our trips, and we've been on the field at Fenway doing stuff with Sox players. We've got tons of stuff dropping so really good stuff there definitely worth your follow at play tessie on both twitter and instagram uh as i said here with pat and joe guys they lost today like i if they had won today if the red sox won the third game in the series this would have been a massive like vibe session it might it might still be they've been good enough where maybe it they deserve that anyway but like had they won and gone to five in a row sweeping the giants like we would have been foaming out the mouth to record this podcast i'm still almost there because they lost today but they didn't play badly by any means i don't know what pat what were you what did what did you think of this series as a whole where's your vibe check at no you got to feel great winning two out of three against uh i mean the giants aren't a great team they're not going to contend for the nl west but they're not the athletics they're not the marlins right now they're not the white Sox. it's a good competitive baseball team you took two out of three from and you Kind of got there in some way, shape, or form, two thirds of their ro- top of the rotation. You lost to one of them today, but you beat the ace, who's a top 
10, 15 guy in baseball. So you got to feel pretty good about that. And I mean, it was one bad inning of baseball today that kind of led to their demise. So, I mean, in totally. I mean, if you're talking, if you're talking Cooper baseball. Yeah. If you're talking Cooper Criswell out dueling Logan Webb, that's a good weekend. It's a good series, whatever that is, considering that the Sox had two bullpen days and the Giants were rolling out maybe the top starters in arguably one of the top five rotations in all of baseball. Like, that's a pat on the back. Yeah, and their approach against Logan Webb, for what it's worth, and, like, obviously we'll get into these games specifically, but I was just so impressed with that. I mean, this offense has lost guys, and they just they put up competitive at-bats. They, like, having Logan Webb, I want, eh, I've got it in the notes. We'll talk about it later, but it was, like, 80-something pitches through three innings. It was crazy. But the thing that I kept looking back on with this series is just that the Giants had the offseason that, like, we wanted the Red Sox to have. Like, they get... Blake Snell and Matt Chapman and Jorge Soler and Jung Hoo Lee. And like, they just like, it was like a slow process for them to get there. It wasn't like they went like in November and signed all of these guys at once and said, here we fucking are. It wasn't that they, they kind of like slow played it and got these guys at the end. But when it was all said and done, they kind of had the coup of the off season, but here they stand. They're the team that's under 500, the Red Sox who had the off season from hell. We've talked about it over and over again. Like, that offseason stunk, but Red Sox now stand 18 and 14. It took the Giants that long enough to figure good spot. out. It took the Giants that long to figure out, oh, we're in a division with the Dodgers. We should be making moves. Yeah. But hey, they're under 500. Diamondbacks were in the World Series. They're under 500. Like, I, I don't know if enough people have talked about how impressive what the Red Sox are doing is, not just, not just in terms of the pitching, because I think that is starting to get a little bit of play. People are starting to talk about the pitching, but the team as a whole, there are good teams that are straddling 500, that are under 500, and the Red Sox are just there, man. Like, people aren't, like, the, the Rays stink, the Jays stink. Sox are better than both those teams right now, and it's not just in the standings. Like, they look better than both those teams. Yeah. But it's The other thing, too, is the last two years, you kind of were always on the edge of they're an injury away. They're an injury away. They're an injury away. Then the injury happens, and then everything falls apart. This is the opposite. The injuries have happened, knock on wood, but the injuries have happened. So when these guys come back in a perfect world and how it should be, they're only going to get better down the line. Like this is kind of your water has found its level here. You're four over. You're going to start getting guys back. Pavetta's on the cusp. Whitlock is on the cusp. Von Grissom's coming back. Bayo. Like Bayo. Like, you have guys coming back who are not depth guys. Like, you're getting, like, three, four, three, four fifths of your rotation back in an everyday second baseman. Yeah. Like, uh, it's going to start picking up. That's what everyone was looking for was them to just, like, tread water while all these guys are out. And that's exactly what they're doing. Not only that, they're inching closer and closer to the shore as they're treading water. Yeah, and you're really going to have to tread water because you got some tough opponents coming up. Like we have, the, we're gonna, they're going to see the Twins next. They've won 10 in a row. The Braves are coming after that. They're going to face Chris Sale. Cannot wait to preview that series because we'll, we'll get into that in a few days, but that'll be interesting. Uh, but what's a little bit more relevant now, there was a lot of moving around roster-wise. Uh, and before we get into the stuff that they added, one of the guys that we kind of like held like a pseudo funeral for Joely Rodriguez and he's just going to stay in the organization. Like we have that clip where like I was singing, who sings the I Will Remember You song? Uh, Sarah McLaughlin. Yeah, Sarah McLaughlin. Like I was singing that and Sammy's like, no, 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 Daughtry, it's not over. And Sammy was right. <laughs> it's not over <laughs> for Joely Rodriguez. He is been outrighted to Worcester. He's going to remain in the organization. Uh-oh. Long live Joe Ellie. Forever! If they if they his walk, it's going to be really sick. Start, start jamming this out I at think, Polar Park. I think we need to make a trip to Worcester and tell... Yeah, we got to tell Joely that this needs to be his walk-in song. He just walks in every day to Daughtry. Oh, my God. He'd be a king. Anyone who's not on his side would immediately come to his side. But so, yeah, Joely's sticking around. Um, however, Pablo Reyes, 
another another interesting one just based off of how we recorded last podcast like we were talking about pablo being the next closer of the red sox pablo potentially winning series mvp for the last series but pablo race has been dfa'd Will you oh man I'm gonna cry, man. Getting oh, emotional. Long live. Long live Pablo Reyes. I hope that we're able to bring Daughtry back for the next pod. I hope that Pablo Reyes stays in the organization. Probably will. But he has been DFA. I, I, yeah, there, I there's a reasonable chance that he does. But we gotta we gotta cover our bases. Sarah McLaughlin. McLaugh McLaughlin? McLaughlin. 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 <laughs> Hopefully, yeah, she she needs to make an appearance. We got to pay our respects to Pablo because he she, is. Uh, she sponsors Bradfo, McLaughlin Energy. <laughs> ah, ah, scream it, Pat! Come on, McLaughlin, McLaughlin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all these things happening though because the Red Sox actually made some additions. Um, at least as it pertains to the Reyes one. Because like obviously you're going to be getting Grissom back, and uh, they are optioning Bobby Dahlbeck for him. But to get, but the DFA for Reyes was to add Zach Short to the roster. Actually, I don't know who was who was coinciding with who because Dom Smith also got added. So they signed Dom Smith. They traded cash for Zach Short. Von Grissom's coming back from injury. He hasn't made his return yet. That was expected, but he got sick. He got the flu, so he didn't. But Dom Smith and Zach Short were added to the roster like within an hour of each other. It was like kind of like a pseudo like end of the roster trade deadline of sorts. A DFA to uh, Gudi- Vladimir Gutierrez. Yes, that was the other DFA. Vladimir Gutierrez. The a lot of very good memories. Which show of hand show of hands you even knew he was on the roster. I knew he was on the roster. Exactly. But like I didn't know that he'd pitched. Apparently he did pitch in Worcester and walked a shit ton of guys. Yep, so like, later, yeah, peace, bro. Uh, I I don't think he gets. I don't think he gets the Sarah McLaughlin. I think you have to have played. No. You have you have to be you have to be Pablo to get the Sarah McLaughlin or Joelle. You have to have have We're made an impact on our hearts. to heart. remember him. If we you can't if you like touch our hearts. But okay, reactions though. I'll, I'll start with Dom Smith because I feel like he might be the more interesting of the additions. Pat, like reactions, Dom Smith, like he hasn't. He hasn't been that good in a little while, but this is a guy who put up really big numbers in 2020 and kind of 2019. It's been a been a few years since then. Yeah, it gets Robert Dahlbeck off my fucking baseball team. I love the move. Welcome to the team, Dom Smith. Happy to have you, pal. Love you. <laughs> we love Dom Smith on this podcast. Joe, no, what, do you, what do you got on Dom Smith? Any Any interesting thoughts on Dom Smith? I mean, if you're going on potential and what he did in the past, this is a good guy to have. But I feel like it was a lot of just insurance in case Garrett Cooper, who left uh, his very first game after getting hit. I feel like that was a little bit uh, of insurance there. And I would not be surprised if by the end of this month, he'll get optioned either to AAA or just flat out release. So it's, it's an insurance pickup. Yeah, I think a lot of it depends on how bad Yoshida's injury actually is. And I would ask Pat to do a Pat's prognosis on this, but we literally know absolutely nothing about it. They are being incredibly secretive about it. Yeah. The Dom Smith thing for me though, it's interesting because they they don't have Tristan Costas for a long time. We'll see how the DH spot plays out. Like maybe they give ref Snyder reps there while with righties on the mound. Like, I don't know, but I kind of see first bases as, as sort of a platoon. Garrett Cooper and Dom Smith, yeah. righty and lefty, like neither of the, like they're both borderline big leaguers. Just put them in positions where they can succeed. Get them get them as many righty lefty matchups as they can get. Like we'll see if either of them produces. You're not really paying either of them anything. But yeah, Bob Bob gets optioned in part because with Garrett Cooper on the roster, it's just you've got a backup third baseman now in Zach Short. You've got two first basemen. One of which hits right-handed. It just it it didn't make sense to have Bob on the roster. It was kind of him or David Hamilton. Valdez got optioned. So much happened. Valdez yeah. Valdez needed to get optioned because he he needs at bats. Grissom's going to be the second baseman. That made sense to me. Yeah. Another factor is 
with Pablo gone, you kind of needed Bobby because you needed somebody with some third base who could play some third base in a pinch. Now, with Zach Short in the fold, he's kind of the utility guy. He can literally play everywhere. So you factor in two new first basemen, one lefty, one righty, both serviceable defense, and then you have Zach Short who can play anywhere you need. Bobby, and unfortunately Pablo, but there was really no reason to have those guys anymore. At least for yeah. Bobby, he can give you multiple positions. Like we've seen him at third, we've seen him at first. There was last year the nightmare at short, but at least he was playing short. The only thing is you can play him as much as you want in these positions, but if he's not making any contact with the ball at all, you can only live with that for so much and it's for so long. Yeah. And Dom Smith, 2020, had a 993 OPS in that shortened season. He played 50 games. And then the year before, in 89 games, he had an 881. But since then, uh, 667 in 21, 560 OPS in 2022. And then last year, had a 692 OPS, playing 153 games for the Nationals. Um, I don't know. I don't think you're going to get a ton from these guys. But the fact of the matter is what they're replacing. They're not. You, know, you can't look at it like they're replacing Casas. They're in there replacing Bobby. Bobby was striking out every single at bat. He had a, like a hit streak purely off of infield hits. Like yeah. that was as much as he was going to give you. Obviously played reasonable defense, but I think I think anyone can understand why these moves were necessary. I, I think I'm just sitting here happy that ownership was like willing to pay minimum salaries because we'd heard all offseason that they had been nickel and diming and dicking around minor league free agents. Garrett Cooper, probably one of those guys because they really yep. liked them and didn't sign them. So you got to give credit where it's due, man. Like I didn't think they had it in them to sign depth guys that are major leaguers. I thought they were just going to keep calling up minor leaguers, but I know it's a low bar, but I am going to give them credit for it. One thing I thought of too the other day, I think it was after it must've been Dom Smith. Imagine if they got Gio Urshela. I know we said like we imagine about it. It would have been perfect. Perfect fit. Yeah, that, perfect fit. Third base, first base, decent defense, decent bat. Like Bobby, they've been fine. I don't want to say that they would be a much better team if Gio Rochelle was on this team because that would be ridiculous. But you wouldn't have as many Bobby at bats, and you got to think of how many inning-ending double plays, strikeouts. It would, yeah. yeah. There's what been a, a lot. What a life it would have been. And to their credit, I, I like we keep talking about it's just so interesting because over the last few years, the Red Sox have had so many like zeros. Yep. Like these you usually don't have multiple position players in a lineup on a daily basis that don't give you defense or offense, but the Red Sox over the last couple of years have put those guys out there a lot. It's wild that they've been able to win the games that they've won with because like Valdez hasn't been hitting and like I get he's made a few good plays on defense but the numbers still do not say that he is a very good defender though he has improved uh you had a lot of David Hamilton at short not hitting and not defending uh you had Bob out there who I guess would defend but when you hit below 100 for most of the season like you are a zero so the fact that they are multiple games above 500 it is incredibly impressive um but moving on from that I guess the last thing Last last housekeeping thing, last news tidbit. I don't know what we want to call it, but last interesting note before we get into the games was that the Red Sox are hiring a consulting team to basically conduct an audit of the organization. People talked a lot about this on Twitter, and I want to say that people don't quite have an idea as to what this means, because I think people think that this is just like, hey, our organization stinks. So how can we how can we get rid of all of the people that make it stink? That that isn't what this is. This is them bringing in a consulting team to basically make sure there's no redundancy. Make sure the organization is they they've hired a ton of new people under Heim Bloom. That was probably the best thing that Heim did was increase the size of the baseball operations department by like multiple X, like tons of new hires. Like you cannot have a small baseball ops department. You're gonna be Fall, you're going to fall behind all these other teams, especially in this division if you do. But when Breslow comes in, kind of just like a new boss to everybody, you don't know the organization. And if you're going to take time to learn the organization, you're not going to be doing your job, doing your job basically what the team needs from you now. Like there's just not enough hours in the day. So they're paying people to, to do that for him, to evaluate things and try to 
find redundancies, find inefficiencies, make sure that everyone doing a job, making sure that they're that what they're doing has an impact with on-field performance. I think that that was my takeaway from it. Yeah, and that's exactly what the takeaway should be. It's just more of housekeeping. It's just looking over everything, making sure everything's in order, that you have one guy here, X guy here, X guy doing this. Just making sure all the boxes are being checked. There's no redundancies. There's no like overstaffing, understaffing in certain areas. It's all it is. It's not it has nothing to do with the product on the field. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt about it. It's literally nothing that fans should be worrying about. This will all take place behind the scenes or it'll be in front when Netflix gets a hold of it and they do True. they do yeah. they do a whole episode on that. So it's nothing that anyone should be too concerned about. It's just it's like going into your human resources or like doing your six month checkup or anything like that, you know, just going to, or the new boss just going around being like, Hi, I'm uh, so and so. Just want to introduce myself. Look forward to a big future. It's like imagine if Craig Breslow had to go to the like hundreds of baseball ops people, or I don't know how many. I, there's at least several There's dozen. Be close to hundred. Yeah. Imagine Craig Breslow going to all of these people and spending like two or three hours with them each to like figure out exactly what are you doing with your time. Like that would be such a waste of Breslow's time, especially during the yeah. season. That would take like, a whole this, week himself. This whole team can probably get it done in a day. Yeah. So we'll we'll let them do what they're gonna do. Uh, I saw I had a lot of people in my comments being like, "Why are they doing this now? They're eighteen and thirteen. Like, what? 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 Things are finally going well, and they're gonna no. God, no. This is just it, don't don't even. I wouldn't even. I don't think we're gonna talk about this one more time for the rest of the year. I think. I think this is a one off. They'll uh, they'll conduct their audit and we won't hear about it. But let's get into the games. Let's get into the games. Game one, I thought was maybe the most uh, enter or most interesting game of the three. They uh, it was supposed to be interesting because we were going to see Grissom and Garrett Cooper both make their Red Sox debuts. But shortly before the game, they announced that Grissom had the flu, so he didn't start. He is expected to make his Red Sox debut uh, Friday. Today, if you're listening on drop day um, in Minnesota, he was at the ballpark on Thursday taking grounders. I'm sure he took BP, like looked like he was ready to go. Uh, and then Garrett Cooper did make his debut, but promptly got hit by a pitch in the wrist in his third at bat and had to come out of the game. It looked really bad. It would it would be like 2024 for yeah. Cooper to be get added on the injured list in his very first game. Yeah, I had someone in my comments be like, yeah, like Grissom, before he makes his return, he's going to walk out of his hotel and have a grand piano fall on his head. Like, that's just kind of where this team is injury-wise. <laughs> it's li- it's literally like, it's insane the amount of injuries that they're going through, and they just continue to add on to it. But Cooper, I mean, we weren't going to judge him after one game, but he at least looks comfortable on the squad. I would say, I if you were asking me, like, I'm not too concerned. You know, he had a uh, game three. Um, he had his most at bats and he actually got on base, but I am nowhere concerned with Cooper fitting in after leaving the game. Yeah. I mean, he played, he played the third game. Uh, he got his first hit. So yeah, I mean, he looks like he's okay. We see that. And he came right out of the game. Like you think, okay, this guy's probably broke his wrist, but glad that didn't happen. Um, before we get into the Logan Webb thing, I kind of want to just like give a little bit of props and maybe by a little bit of props, like a lot of bit of props to Cooper effing Criswell, who has thrown back to back outings of five innings, no earned. I, at one point in the off season called him the face of everything bad. Not not because he deserved that, but because anytime we talked about him, it, the story was this is the only free agent they signed. Yeah, it was Cooper Criswell, but he's been really good. Like they're not letting him like approach a hundred pitches or anything, but that's probably by design. He's done everything they've asked and more. Yeah, the thing with Criswell is, and Sammy said it back in shout out to Sammy because right when they signed him, he said it. They needed a depth starter a guy who can go out there start a game, give you. Four, maybe five innings if he's efficient. And he's done that, 
He's done that way better than anybody thought. He was going to be a guy who's going to come in, give you three, four innings, maybe let up to, you know, two, three earned, have around a low four, mid four ERA. Nah, this guy's a low key dealing. He looks great. He's been in when yeah, it's, it's, half the staff goes down. You're praying for innings. Never mind effective, low scoring innings. And he's giving you that. Shout out Criswell. I mean, it, it's hard, at least for me, to like divide it between Chriswell do, being good and Andrew Bailey's like philosophy. Because literally, almost every pitcher, I would say, eighty percent of the staff that we've seen from the Sox, from the starters to the bullpen, have looked absolutely dominant, dominant. And Chriswell is just adding on to that. So I'll give him his praise. But I think this goes back to Andrew Bailey's philosophy and how everyone seems to buy in. And you can even go back to. Uh, Alex Cora talking about getting an em- it seems to be just like he's emphasizing at least the starters role no matter who that is so they're coming out they're being aggressive um, so I look at it more from a philosophy standpoint but of course I'm going to give Chris well his flowers because he deserves them yeah I mean you got to go out there and you got to throw the ball like they they can preach whatever they want to but you got to be open to taking that that coaching open to all of the philosophies and you got to be able to execute it in a game situation when your team's counting on you and he's done that and more it's interesting like they basically the rotation right now is down to like two full-on starters it's how can it's cutter and then you've got Criswell throwing like 75 ish pitches you've got Winkowski throwing 50 60 pitches and then you've got a bullpen game which we're going to see in the twin series they're going to do a full-on bullpen game we'll see if Uwasawa goes in there though he did go today um, so it can't be that much, but we'll see, we'll see how they handle that, but they'll get Pavetta and Bayo back seemingly very soon. Whitlock, hopefully not too long after that, but it does seem like he's getting delayed a little bit. So we'll, we'll keep our eyes there. But the fact of the matter is you get Pavetta and Bayo back and Chris Wells, your five, like you're still feeling pretty good about things. Every game you feel like you go into with a chance to win. And that is not something that we've been able to say every single year. So and I say that kind of ironically because I didn't give them a chance to win this first game of the series. And they did win in part because of Cooper Criswell, but also they took it to Logan Webb. This is one of the top 10 pitchers in baseball right now, I think is fair to say. And they had him at 80 pitches through three, knocked him out in the fourth. You had big hits from Ref Snyder, big hits from Willier. Willier had a ridiculous game. This guy just continues to crush the ball. Willier Abreu is like, like he's getting national recognition now. Like if you've got a right-handed pitcher on the mound, and like he still definitely has his warts against lefties. But the fact of the matter is the majority of pitchers in baseball are righties. He's going to be out there every single day against those guys. And he's putting together awesome, awesome at bat. Yeah. Willier, we'll get to it, but two great games in the series back to back. He's a man on fire fire right now he's looking every bit not only as a major league level outfielder but a legit bat in a major league lineup he has to be in the top half of the lineup has to play every day one thing that's going very much under the radar up until he made that catch the other day his defense has vastly improved since the first two three weeks of the series he looks phenomenal right now yeah, the yeah he's got to be he, he's got to be in the lineup no matter who it is, you're not playing the situation. And you have, I would say, Yoshida's injury kind of offers a little bit of flexibility where you can take O'Neal out of left, put him in DH, and then you could put Ref Snyder in there. That way it helps you helps Abreu continue to be in the lineup because going into the year, it essentially felt like it was going to be Abreu, Ref Snyder, maybe Yoshida, at least in the outfield mix, uh, depending on the matchup. But Abreu has as you guys have said, just turned a bunch of heads and he does deserve to be in the lineup every day. Yeah. And he helped get the Red Sox up for nothing. They scored a run in each of the first four innings. Criswell was done after five. And this might be one of the more impressive parts of this game, but they handed it off. Each of these guys got an inning. You got Bernardino, Weissert, Kelly, and Slayton. And after this outing, they all went scoreless. They took a 4 nothing lead and were able to keep it away, keep it out of the hands of Chris Martin and Kelly Jansen, get those guys a day off, 
and you look down the line after game one, I know these uh, these ERAs have changed since then, but at the time when they finished that game, Bernardino ZRA, 079. Weissert, 150. Kelly, 0. Slayton, 052. Like, it is so valuable to be able to put the game in the hands of your non primary relievers and have confidence that it's going to be closed out. Like they they could have let in a run and it and it would have gone to Jansen at the end and like that's okay that's expected but the fact that they don't do that that they just kind of take the reins and it's not even like they were like letting it letting up base runners like Slayton put a couple of guys on but none of the other guys let up hits it's just, it was I was so I was almost as impressed with that as I was with the offense so the offense for me takes the cake with the eighty pitches through three against Webb but that bullpen man. We knew it was going to be a strength going into this season, but it is, it has been all that. Yeah. Lived up to every ounce of hype we gave them. We said they were incredibly deep. They had a lot of interesting arms. The guys who started with the major league team this year look good. The guys they had to call up from AAA have looked just as good, if not better. Yeah, if not better. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. it, the depth there is. Yeah, and everyone crazy. knows, everyone knows what their role is. We were kind of. Not left in the dark, but we kind of knew like Chris Martin was the eighth guy. Jansen is your ninth or the save. It was where these, where everyone else is going to be. And obviously, uh, Bernardino is a middle inning guy. Phenomenal. Just everyone in their role is playing it to a T perfectly. Yeah. I mean, Bernardino's ERA now 073. Like, this is a guy that didn't make the it's opening mad. day roster. And, like, can we get the whole bullpen out to the All Star game? Cause it feels like that's where it sh- should be going. I know. It's it's crazy. Cause, like, they, I feel like only closers get the All Star nod. But, and Jansen has an ERA in the ones, too. So it's not taking away him anything away from Kenley Jansen. But, like, when Justin Slayton goes out there, it's just, it's over for you, man. Like, you're not getting anything done. Um, but let's do some game two talk here because Cutter started game two and he had never gone seven innings before in his career. He did that. He he did that in game two without necessarily his best stuff. He was good. Don't get me wrong. He was good. But again, I said this last time with Cutter. I'm I'm honestly more impressed when you don't have your best stuff and you're able to get length and keep your team in the game. And in this case, he more than kept his team in the game. Like he won the game for them. If you go seven innings, two runs, you're putting your team in not just like a position to have a good shot to win. Like you're, you're putting your team in a position to win the game. And he did that. That's a full, that's a full confidence booster for cutter already. Like if it wasn't already sky high, his confidence is going to be through the fucking roof considering now he's top five in the ERA. And as you said, he did not have stuff, but he still went to the seventh inning for the first time in his career. And he finished the seventh inning. So I think for Cutter, when he's not having his stuff, you can still breathe a sigh of relief where his his B plus stuff or his B stuff is still going to be able to win you some games. And that's the sign of a really good pitcher when you don't have like we see so many guys. Like I'm trying to think of guys like this. I don't know. Oh, back in eh. I don't know. I was going to maybe Hunter Green is a good example of a guy who when he's on is untouchable. But like there's days where he walks like five or six guys and it's just like you're just not going to win those games. But yeah, Pat, what do you think of Cutter? What, what are, where are you at with Cutter as a whole right now? Yeah, I think last year it was hard not to like what you saw. The My biggest gripe with him last year was not going deep into games. He's now either his last two or two of his last three starts has gone deep into games. His fastball is still playing. He's just building and building and building and building. He is by no means a finished product. He's by no means reaching, you know, his potential. There's still so much there, which is crazy to think about considering how dominant and how good he has looked so far this year. It's hard not to absolutely love Cutter Crawford this year. He looks phenomenal. Yeah, and that that one-two punch of of how can Cutter? I know Bleacher Report didn't have them in their top ten one-two punch in baseball right now, but. To me, hell is up with their rankings. To me, when you got those guys out there starting the game, you feel really, really, really good about your chances. And they have, even in their worst starts, given you a chance, given you length. Like, how had that really bad start against the Angels where he let in seven, but only four of it was earned, and he was still able to almost, he almost got you six. Like, we're 
not even a year removed of not being able to get anything more than five from any of these guys. You were lucky to get five from all of these guys. And now everyone is getting you five at minimum. You're getting five from Cooper Criswell. Like you're getting five at least from Cutter and Hauk and when they were healthy, Whitlock and Bayo and Pivet. Like it's all but a guarantee at this point. We have not really seen like a blow up start from these guys. And the longer you do that, the fresher your pen stays. But the guy that may have been the star, I shouldn't even say may have been the star of this game. The guy that was the co-star of this game with Cutter was Connor Wong. Connor Wong, three for four, RBI, uh, two doubles. Just, I mean, he continues to play out of his mind. I'm going to pull up his current stats because I I had the stats after that game. His current OPS now, 975. He's hitting 351. You forgot something, Gordo. What did I forget? That stealth defense behind the plate. Oh, my God, that play. Incredible. Who... It was, it was like a swinging bunt. It was Matt Chapman. Uh, yeah. And it was like a swinging bunt down the third baseline, like way out of the catcher's range. Like this is easy in the territory of like shit or shit out of luck. That's a yeah. hit. And it was like a big spot too because there was already a man on first and I believe no outs in the inning. So it could have been first yep. and second, no outs. Wong sprawls out. He like slides on his pad, but is able to like kick himself up mid slide to – it was like a pop-up slide, but in catcher's gear. That was so smooth. It literally looked like he planned to do all that. I think he just did. One fluid mo- Yeah, one fluid motion, and it was seamless. That was like the best way to describe it. That's the shit that Brandon Phillips used to do at second base, and you just saw <laughs> Connor Wong do that from behind the dish in catcher's gear. And then he just gets up like it's no big deal. Like he's just like, yeah. Okay. Uh, Gives up the uh, fingers like, one outs, boys. And I'm like, yep. do you not know what you just fucking did, guy? That was sick. One down, brother. One down. <laughs> Spin it. One. Throw that. Throw <laughs> that one up. <laughs> and that's yeah, crazy Connor that Wong- all we all we were looking for was competent defense from him because he's not he's not the best framer. Like if you're looking on a game for offense, you're going to Wong. If you need more of a defensive side of things, you're going to Reese. And if Wong is doing stuff like that, you can feel so much better to put him in the lineup. Yeah. I mean, I just it's it's crazy because like we we talk about the future of the catching position with Teal because Teal's obviously one of the best prospects in baseball, but it's hard to not feel good every day at catcher with Wong out there and to feel totally fine with Reese out there too. Uh, in this game, game two, they won this game six to two. Six different players had an RBI in this game. You had Duran, Devers, Ref Snyder, Wong, Dominic Smith. In his Red Sox debut, drove in a run on a single. And then Emmanuel Valdez drove in a run. At the time, it was a pretty big run off the monster. Uh, just really good to see a well-rounded offensive attack. Everyone in the lineup besides Tyler O'Neill had a hit. You, we This year has not been the year of that for the Sox. Like Their runs for a while were only coming on homers. But now it, it does feel like there's a little bit more of a well-rounded offensive attack. I don't know how sustainable it is just because there's still not like a ton of firepower in terms of names in the lineup, but it's hard not to be impressed with what you're seeing. Like they've done, they've done more in the last week and a half than I thought we would see in like a month's time with this offense. I guarantee like I'll even like go to the grave with this, that Jaron Duran is going to do one of two things this year. He's either going to steal home or he's going to hit an inside the parker. Because that, that's just the kind of speed I think he had. He almost came close in that game one in Seattle. But he literally, if he wanted to, he maybe could have gone home and at least force a play at the plate. Yeah. Not saying not saying he would have scored, but I feel like it's it's coming. I feel like it's going to happen. Something big. Joey Hot takes over here. Jared Duran. No, you're, you're, not, you're not saying either or. You're saying both. Joey Hot takes over here. Duran is hitting an inside the park home run and stealing home this year. You heard it here first on play testing. Sure, I'll say I'll say and even though I said or before. Yeah, he's he said and. <laughs> can edit edit that out. We'll edit that out. He said it. <laughs> That's right. I have the controls to do it. Yeah. At the end of the game, Martin good eighth. Good to see him bounce back from his tough outing last time. And then Weiser comes on in a four run lead in the ninth. Jansen could have come out, but they didn't. They tried to get, they gave it to Weiser to see if he could hold it. He did. Another day saved of Kenley Jansen pitching which is not to say that you don't want to see Kenley Jansen pitching because he's going to blow it, but you want him to save his bullets. This is an older pitcher, uh, a guy has, who's been susceptible to injury, guy you want to keep fresh. And it's 
good that they were able to do it. Um, game three, Winkowski, probably his best outing, even probably. though he led in a run. He, he's gone three scoreless, but like, I don't know, four and a third, one run. Like from a starter, like, I don't know. What, what, would you guys rather have four and a third, one run from a starter or three innings scoreless? Four to third. Saves you in the long run. Saves you the next day, two days after, resting guys and everything. I mean, you should be able to score yeah, one and run. Considering the, yeah, considering the staff that this is, it, the deeper you go, the better. Yeah. But like he didn't he didn't have he didn't have his best stuff, I will say. Like he was kind of all over the plate early on. He obviously gave up the bomb to uh Yastrzemski. But again, if you'll go you like you'll take that if you can get length out of it, considering how thin you are in the rotation and in the bullpen. Yeah. And we we've all watched this team enough. Like we saw Winkowski throw last year and we've seen Winkowski throw this year. It's clear that he is not quite the same guy that he was last year. Like last year he was dominant. This, I mean, his four and a third today, he was good results. Didn't have a strikeout and has not been missing bats for a little bit of time. Now we know he's dealing with an ankle thing. He has a bone chip in there. That's been something he's been dealing with and he will deal with it the whole year. But the fact of the matter is, like, this is hopefully something that's not like you're. Hopefully, you're not going to need Winkowski to start a ton of games for you this year. Hopefully, guys can get and stay healthy. As I say that, I know that's not going to happen. Like, you're probably going to need like 20 stars from him if I'm being real. Like, he's your uh, first option when another pitcher goes down, and I say when, not if. When? Yeah, it really is a when thing, isn't it? It, it pretty but. much is. Like who's who's left to get injuries? Cutter and Tanner, they'll they'll yeah. end up on the IL at some point. All right, shut yeah. up, Joe. <laughs> hey, no, Pat, it's called a reverse jinx. You ever hear of this? A reverse jinx? Yeah, a reverse, a reverse jinx. jinx. It's a reverse jinx attempt, and they work. Skip Bayless uses it all the time. It's a thing. Uh, that's where your issue lies. <laughs> oh, no, no, Skip Skip's a genius, man. Skip it. Skip is a legend. <laughs> okay. Skip married Ernestine. No idiot marries Ernestine. You gotta be a smart man. Skip's a smart man, but <laughs> yeah, the the offense really uh in this game was the issue. They had a lot of opportunities. Kyle Harrison walked five guys in this game. Uh, they had bases loaded in the first inning. Couldn't score. A uh, lot of base runners, a lot of traffic in those first five innings that Harrison pitched and were only able to push across one run on the Tyler O'Neill double. That 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 is where the game was lost. Like, yeah. they were tied one-to-one. Do I have that right? Yeah, it was tied one-to-one for a while. Yep. Uh, you Wink came out of the game. You got it to Bernardino. He was good, in, inning scoreless. And then yeah. Kelly came in, and he let in a couple, and... The offense just never like the the guys at the end of the Giants bullpen just overpowered like Walker and Doval. Which, which Rogers was it? Taylor. Like this, no, I think it was Tyler. Tyler. Let me check. Yeah, it's Tyler. Okay, I always get it confused. It's like they're twins or something. And they, yeah, they're they're twins, and they both throw the ball like I don't, I don't even know how to describe how they throw the ball. Like they don't have a bone in their arm. Yeah. Go watch a video of them warming up in the bullpen at the same time, which they've done, and it looks if, really fucking weird. If you want to physically wince, watch them throw in slow motion. You would think every bone in their arm is broken. Like you would think it'd be like that Jaden Daniels picture where his like elbows like bulging yes. out. Yes. <laughs> like when they throw, it looks like the blow up things outside of a car dealership, the ones that like <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, Sox didn't hit that. Um, and Duvall is just, I mean, he comes in throwing 100. He's like, so good. He's ridiculous. Yeah. He came up Ellie? from the minors like a few years ago, and it was basically just like, yeah, like this guy is obviously going to close for them, and he's obviously going to be good at it. If they want to do it now, they can. And in that postseason, they did it, and he hasn't let the roll up since. He's really, really, really good. And yeah. Sox have faced a lot of really good closers this year. Like, it feels like all of their losses, it's like, there's Duvall or there's Class A. Like, that's basically, like, here's Andres Munoz who's pumping 100 at you. Like, that's the type of guys that the Sox have been facing in the ninth. It's been crazy. Mason Miller. Oh, my God. I forgot the craziest one. Oh, wait. They did sweep, but they did face him. They did, and he shut their asses down. That was nuts. He's so good. We, we don't see anything like that. 
No. He's been hitting 104 this year. No. We get that geriatric Clay Holmes. Ugh. Clay Holmes, he sucks. Um, only other noteworthy thing I have from this game was Uesawa made his debut today. Uh, six up, six down. Does not throw hard, but got the results, man. It, if his location's on, mm-hmm. like he's throwing those change ups in the bottom right of the zone. If he's gonna put the, put his pitches down there, locate them. I don't know. He can be somewhat effective. Yeah, he, for this team. He brought the finesse. He brought the finesse, like that radar gun. I was like, is it eventually like his fastball barely breaks ninety? His curve is literally what you'd see back in the day of mid seventies, and then his splitter was it it didn't have the speed but it had like the movement on it and it induced like a bunch of pop-ups from san francisco i think in terms of a placeholder because i know that it's not going this is not going to last for uasawa he's just here for a cup of coffee but you give him that kind of start six up six down in like garbage time he can provide for you let's uh Let's pick a let's pick a series MVP here. I think uh, we've talked good with the games. I think it's time. I was hoping for a sweep, but we're gonna pick a series MVP. And Sammy's not here, but Sammy has sent in his pick for this, and he's also sent in his picks for the previews. So series MVP pick from Sammy. He picked Connor Wong. So one vote for Connor. Obviously, we talked about how great he was in game two. Um, Joe, I'm gonna give you the floor. Who's your pick for series Ooh. MVP? Oh man, that that's tricky. I I might need to agree with Sammy just at game two from Wong himself making the play and then the three hits. I would say I would say runner up would be Cutter Crawford and then Willie Abreu. But I I kind of like Sammy's pick of uh Connor Wong. I think he himself helped you win that game. Pat. Uh, so coming in before I do the lineup today, I was thinking Willier. Willie didn't do anything today because he wasn't in the lineup. But no one in the lineup did anything today. I'm going Willier. I think Willier had a great first two games. His thick ass was running. Triple, double, knocking in ribbies. I'm going Willier. We're going to have three different picks here. Wow. Because I'm going with Rob Refsnyder. Rob Refsnyder drove in the go-ahead run against Logan Webb. Had a great game. Was two for five. Put together really good at-bats. And that's against a righty. And then in game two, we drove in the go-ahead run there too. This is the guy who put you ahead, put you on top both games. It's tough because, like, I was thinking about getting a little bit creative and, like, giving it to Andrew Bailey just because, like, holy shit what he's done with guys like Cooper Criswell and Cutter Crawford and the bullpen. But I w- I'm not going to do it. I'm going to go with Raf Snyder. But we've got two for Wong, one for Abreu, and one for Ref Snatter, which means that Connor Wong is our Play Tessie series MVP. Props to Connor. Congrats, Connor. Congrats, Congrats Connor. Connor Wong. Um, let's let's preview this next series, man. Let's preview the series. We've got Sox heading out to Minnesota to face the Twins. The Twins are on fire. Winners of 10 in a row. Record currently stands at 17 and 13. So they have made up for their slow start and some. They are on fire. Uh, game one, you got Tanner Houck versus Chris Paddock, the Sheriff. Houck, is, Houck has a 1-6 ERA coming off six and two-thirds, one run, nine Ks. That was against the Cubs. Chris Paddock has a 5-8-8 ERA. He's coming off five innings of four-run ball with two strikeouts against the Angels. But before that, he had seven scoreless against the White Sox. So take it for what it's worth. Chris Paddock, re- recovering from injury, uh, kind of trying to make a comeback, was a highly regarded prospect, had a really good rookie year and then kind of up and down since then a lot of injuries game two bullpen day for the red Sox. we'll see where they go with that I have no idea how they're going to do it because uasawa threw a bunch today so we'll see who's who's going to get the bulk of that but pablo lopez the ace of the twins going in, in game two for them he had a he has a 483 era this season he's coming off of five innings four earned with eight strikeouts against the angels so he has not been as good as he was last couple years, but I'm sure he's going to get back to that. It's Pablo Lopez. He's one of the best in the game. Uh, third game, Cooper Criswell has a 165 ERA. As we said, he's coming off back to back five scoreless appearances against Cleveland and San Francisco. And going for the Twins is Joe Ryan. He has got a 338 ERA. He's coming off six innings, two earned with three Ks against the White Sox. Uh, hitters for the Twins. 
they've been impressive lately on the season. Not a ton of like 900 plus OPS guys that you're oh like ooh, not gonna look at these guys and there's really only one guy that has it. It's Ryan Jeffers, their catcher's got a 948 OPS. But going into the series, Buxton day to day injured, so we will see if he plays in the series. Not a big home run hitting team. Edward Julian is their top home run hitter with seven. He's the only player on this team that has more than five home runs. However, over the last week of baseball, like we said, they have won 10 in a row. Over the last week of baseball, they have seven players with an OPS of 900 or better. Alex Kirloff, Max Kepler, Kyle Farmer, uh, Carlos Santana, Ryan Jeffers, Willie Castro, Jose Miranda. All OPS is over 900 in the last seven days. So this team is red hot. Sammy sent in a series prediction. He is taking two out of three in this series. I'll go Pat first to this one. Pat, how are you feeling about Sox Twins? Two of the hotter teams in baseball here. Red Sox sweep. Whoa. Wow. I had a lot of that. Yeah. I Not, think, or at least predicting wise. Yeah. I think Paddock sucks. Point blank. Pablo Lopez. We're getting him at a good time. He hasn't been cooking right around the summer. He'll kind of tick it up and he'll end the year around his normal low threes. But right now he doesn't look all that great. Joe Ryan, I think is the best pitcher they'll see this week. I think that that third game is going to be an actual like a really good game. I think they get the edge in that one over Joe Ryan. I'm feeling like supremely confident. You just want to see us against the Giants. You want to see us against the Cubs. Everyone in the rotation and bullpens pitching well. Offense is firing on all cylinders with third and fourth stringers out there. You get Von Grissom back. I'm feeling supremely confident. I'm going sweep. All right. I love it. We have not had a lot of wow. sweep predictions so far i i, I want to get there joe i'll let you go first what do you, what you do need you one you need it gordo um it's kind of funny i was like looking over because i wrote down what sammy said and he's kind of on the same wavelength as me i think tanner hauk uh is is rolling and he's gonna keep it going mate and um game two that's the tbd i think lopez and minnesota wins that one so i'll go and then and then chriswell i don't know if he can out duel Joe Ryan, but it might be a, a last inning kind of thing for the Sox. So I think Sox will take two out of three. I say they win game one, uh, they win game two, or they, I'm sorry, they win game one, lose game two, and win game three. So I'm kind of on Sammy same length. Also, I just don't believe in the Twins. They won 10 straight, but seven of the 10 came against the White Sox, for crying out loud. Good point. Good point, Braverman. I like that. That's a uh... I was already going to go Sox winning the series, but now you're making me feel a little bit more confident. I did not realize that seven of them were against the White Sox. Oh, my God. Yeah. So I'm going to take two out of three for the Sox. And the other three are the Angels, just so we're we're clear. All right. All right. That's good. That's good, because now they got to face the big, bad Red Sox. And they're going to lose two out of three. Sox are going to win the first one with Hauk. They're going to beat Pablo Lopez. I don't know why I feel so confident about it, but I just do. But... I feel like every time we see Joe Ryan, he shoves it up their ass. I think he's going to do it again. Uh, day game, something about Joe Ryan during the day. I feel like he's going to shove it up their ass. Sox will like, lose that game like 4-1 to one or something. They won't score in that yeah. game. But yeah. 2 out of 3 against the Twins. Complete game shutout a year ago. Oh, God, that might be why I think that then. Uh, yeah, the complete game shutout a year ago. We totally shut them down. Yeah. It could be worse. And I think it was a day game. Could be worse. He could still be on the Tampa Bay Rays. That is so true. <laughs> Thank God. Nelson Cruz for Joe Ryan. Praise the <laughs> Lord. So I'm going to go two out of three there. So we're all optimistic in this series, even though the Twins are riding hot, but so are the Sox. Uh, Pat, what's the time for? It is time for Crystal Bomb. Bomb it. Bomb it. Bomb it. So just to recap, no one hit a home run, so no one got any points in the Giants series. I wasted my own. Oh, wait, no. You wasted your O'Neill pick. I picked Ref Snyder. Yeah, I did. I did. But, you know, there are ebbs and flows in Crystal Bomb. So I, don't know which, I don't know pick? which is bad between an ebb and a flow. But whatever the bad is between an ebb and a flow, that was this giant series. I believe I it's an ebb. It's got to be ebb. It's got to be ebb, right? I've never heard that word used in anything besides ebb Other and than flow. the saying. Yeah, but yeah. it's got to be ebb. Flow is good. Yeah. So 
All right. So then, Gordo, you never kick us off. You kick I'll, us off. I'll kick it off. Well, actually, Sammy kicked it off because he already texted us. So Sammy picked uh, – he picked Abreu, right? He picked Thick Willie? Thick Willie. So Sammy picked Thick Willie, but I will kick off this podcast. I'm going with the new guy. We're going with Dom. We're going Dom. Whoa. Wow. We're going Dom. There's three righties on the mound. He's going to play every game. We are going Dom. Dom is going to make me proud. He Dom is going deep in Minnesota. Dom, it, it's happening. Dom is going to make it happen. All right. I don't know who it's going to be. Off. It might be in the first game off Chris Paddock. Dom's going to make it happen. So we're going Dom. All right. All right. That is kind of a reach, but. <laughs> Joe, go oh. for it. Oh, man. Uh, you know what? Right field is a very, um, it's very favorable to the left-handed hitter. So I think let's go with old reliable. Let's go with Rafi Devers. I think he's he's kind of slumping in terms of his power. I think he regains it in Minnesota at some point this weekend. I'll go with Devers. Yeah. Joe brought up a good point. Right field plays well, though, the old lefties. Going Jaron Duran. I like it, Pat. I, I thought about going Duran. The only reason I didn't do it is going to do it inside the Parker. Oh, my God. We need the, that is the, the ballpark to hit it in. We need an inside the park crystal bomb. I would go nuts if we had an inside the park crystal bomb. Can we make a rule? You want to double? You want to double down on? It? I would like to make a rule. What's your rule? If your crystal bomb player hits an inside the park home run, it's two points. I think I'm. I, mean, in, I think I'm in for that. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'll, I'm in I'll, for that. Beautiful. It'll I'll, I'll agree to, to it. Jaren. I like it. Yeah. Maybe Sedan will get on the board with one of those too. But, yeah, I mean, yeah, how, I many, how many guys that. on the roster? How many guys on the roster can really are able to hit inside the parkers outside of Duran? Yeah, I like I like it though, and it, I I do respect. I think everyone was right to pick lefties in this series, right field in in Minnesota, but also they've got three righties on the mound. So good picks by everyone. So Sammy's not here to host guys being dudes, but. Fuck it. It's time for guys being dudes. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah bro. <laughs> guys being dudes. We pick a guy that played for both the team that the Red Sox are playing and the Red Sox. No winners, no losers, just vibes. It's time for guys being dudes. Pat, who you got? Oh. This is a fun one. I... I'm going to go with – no. No, I kind of want to. Is no, an obvious I, I have to. No, 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 I will. It's a cheesy answer, but David Ortiz. That's fair. Someone has yeah. to do it. Someone has to. We have to go with the big names, the big guys at some point. I'll go with Poppy. I'm usually the obscure one. I'll go with Poppy. I love it. Do we have any, like, David Ortiz stories? No, he didn't really do anything in Boston. So No. Just... I think he was here – 2004 to he wasn't here that long i think it was 04 to 16 yeah it's not that long in the grand scheme he might of life, he might have had think... like a he might have had like a hit yeah i don't think he played the field either so yeah so it's basically you can slice the time in half yeah yeah honestly no. since you were only seeing him at the plate like most of their of players times is in the field so it's like he basically wasn't even on the team yeah no, no, I would agree. It's so okay. So yeah, your guys being dudes really didn't even play for the Red Sox. So good pick, Pat. Yeah. Uh, all right, come back to me. I'll I'll think of a guy who played a little bit more. All right, Braverman, <laughs> you got anyone for us? Guys being dudes. Uh, I'm actually I'm like circling through the list, and how about someone who was maybe the most underrated player of 2000? Maybe not the most, but one of the more underrated players from that 04 championship run how about orlando cabrera the dude there took over at short everyone was wondering what is going to happen now when nomar traded i mean he wasn't going to be the shortstop for the future but he came in he provided spunk he provided personality to an already fun 04 championship team he had great defense over there at short and for the one year that he brought the Sox in that 04 championship he might have been the most fun out of all of them. So Orlando Cabrera. 
for my uh, GBD. I'm curious, Braverman. Do you think that the Red Sox got Orlando Cabrera from the Twins, or are you saying that because he played for the Twins later? He played for the Twins later. Yeah, I'm, he just, did. I'm just saying. I, okay, yeah, I'm just. Who did I, they when get he from came the over in, that in trade? the trade? Oh, who did they get? They did um, get a player from the Twins in that trade. That wasn't Minkiewicz, was it? It was Doug Minkiewicz. Oh, okay. He, uh, they were playing the Twins at the time. All he had to do was walk across the field and that's perfect. Set up shop. That's perfect. But yeah, my guys yeah, being he dudes. Can, yeah. My guys being dudes, I'm going to go with Nick Punto, the shredder. Oh, um, oh, that's a good one. He was part of the uh, trade that sent Carl Crawford, Adrian Gonzalez, Josh Beckett to the Dodgers. I call it the Nick Punto trade. Uh, not a ton of time in Boston, but he was in the fantasy football league that Bradford organized. So I, I was in that league with him. He's a really good dude. Uh, fun in the group chat. Uh, but yeah, Nick Punto, definitely more memorable of a career with the Twins than the Red Sox. What do you got, Pat? Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. I really botched that first pick. I picked someone who played the field. I'll go Danny Valencia. Ooh, I've got a Valencia story. Hmm. Yeah, of course you do. Let's hear it. I was once sitting, uh, it was when he played for the Blue Jays, and I watched him and Aaron Sanchez pick up a couple of chicks. Right, They were sitting right next to the dugout. And they were like throwing baseballs and pens at them to get their numbers. And they got them. They got the numbers. And then they were like, Smoke. meet us. Like, like it was like eighth inning. They were like, okay, like go to the, meet us at the clubhouse after. And like they, they left the seats to go to the clubhouse. I was like, oh shit. Like Danny Valencia, you got game. He a stud. Game. But. What a stud. We've got a uh, Bruins puck drop super shortly. So let's, uh. Let's get these uh, enough seds out of the way and we can wrap this baby up. Uh, I'm going to go first. Go Mine's like kind of random. And it's weird. We kind of like weirdly talked about this on the show with the ebb and flow thing. But I was like, I was thinking about it. What is a word, if you can think of any, do you guys have any words that you've heard a million times, but you have no idea what it means? I've got one. I have no idea what attrition means. Attrition? Yeah, no idea. Don't look at me. Really? Okay, maybe yeah, it's not I'm, that weird that I don't know. I keep there's so word. many phrases it's a part of, but I could not give you a definition off the top of my head. Okay, there you go. So I'm not alone. Yeah, there's, attrition. Oh God, there's a word that Sammy like, uses. I had to look up yeah, the. I think I think attrition oh, is like something. Was, oh, is yes. that a word? Is that two words? I don't know. I it just means a lot, right? I think so, or like excessive. Yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. And I think good. for attrition, it's like stamina or something like that. I refuse to look it up. I'm not doing it. Pat, you want to go next? Yeah, I'll go next. Um, I did have one. Uh, oh, yes. Me and Sammy talk about it all the time. If you go to Dunks or you go anywhere and you buy iced coffee and you don't get less ice... You're a loser. I They messed up my order today, and I got normal ice. I think I got a third of the coffee. I drank it in 30 seconds. More bang for your buck, smarter investment, more caffeine, more coffee, less ice. Same tweet, money. Tweet at Play Tessie a picture of your Dunkin' Ice coffee with less ice and tell me you don't feel like you just had three coffees. <laughs> That's my enough said. Less ice is more drink. I do not drink I mean, coffee, but I guarantee are, you that would be my favorite talking? cheat code if I did. No, like if so, if you I don't have a cup, but if this is the cup, right? They if you wash them, fill it with ice. They fill it to about here. Yes. So if you go between halfway between the end of the red and the top of the right there, right where your finger just was, that is ice where your index finger is. The rest is coffee. If you get less ice, it's where like the red ends. It's wow. exponentially more coffee. Exponentially. That's yeah, my that's, I I I definitely do that with just like drinks in general. I always load up on the ice, even though I don't plan to. And then all well, of a sudden, you're pouring boom, it for it, yourself. If you're pouring a drink for yourself, like it's coming from your own fridge, your own freezer, yeah, load up on the ice. But you're I agree. If you're if you're somewhere else, if you're buying a drink from Dunks, like it's just obvious. It's like, would you rather get twice as much liquid? Yeah. Yeah, fair. Fair deal. All right, Braverman. 
You got anything for uh, us? You're the last one. I do. I do got enough said. It's a quick one. Shout out um, to the beekeepers of the world because they saved a baseball game. If you guys saw. Oh, yeah. The Diamondbacks and the Dodgers were delayed two hours by a swarm of bees. And they literally had to call a beekeeper on speed dial being like, can you come help us? He dropped everything. Apparently, like, I forget where I read it, but he was on his, he was kid, at, at his like, kid's t-ball game. Yes, he was at his kid's t-ball game. He drops it, drives to the stadium, and he's basically cheered like he just won the World Series. And then they have him throw out the first pitch, which, by the way, whoever was scheduled for that first pitch probably got to be salty as fuck to have him overtake it for the first pitch. But shout out to the beekeepers of the world because I hate bees. At I all. also and hate I'm glad, bees. Yeah. Glad that he bees. was able to do it. He was really yeah. yucking it up too. Like he was like, he was pumping up the crowd. It's like this guy's in a beekeeper outfit. He like <laughs> he had like a big face reveal. Whoa! Like that, was a, that guy's a legend. He <laughs> should, was getting interviews. How much should I spray? Should I spray him twice? Should I spray him three times? What yeah. there was he knew what he was thing. doing. He knew he was a hero. Oh, he got his own baseball card. Did you see that? Yep. No way. Yep. Really? Yeah, Tops. Yeah, that. Tops made a baseball card. I, I don't know. I hope a picture's out. If, if a picture's out, we have, I have not seen it yet, but I heard they're doing it. They probably have it out. But what a legend. Yeah. So shout, shout out to the, to the beekeepers of the world out there. Oh, wow. That, I'm looking at it right now. That is shocking that they made, that they actually made a card for them. Yeah. All right, let's wrap this baby up. We got puck drop momentarily for the bees. Hopefully, there is no game seven in this series. Oh shoot! Yeah, like look at that Wait, is that signed? Did he sign the cards? Yes. <laughs> he did not. They did not have this guy sign he the cards. Knew what he was doing. He knew. They knew what he was doing. He knew what he was doing. He knew he was the hero. He is the hero. But to wrap this baby up, though, this has been episode 69. Very nice episode tonight from your boys, me, Gordo, Pat, and Joe Braverman here standing in for Sammy. Before you leave, before you move on to whatever's next in your day, remember, hit that subscribe button, whether it's Apple, Odyssey, App, or Spotify. Hit the subscribe button. Rate it five stars as well. Tell us what you think of Beekeepers on YouTube. Subscribe to WEI. Go find our playlist there. Hit the thumbs up on YouTube. Follow us on all of our socials at Playtessie on both Twitter and Instagram. As I said at the beginning, we've got tons of awesome content coming out on those platforms every single day. Content with Red Sox players, both of the present and future of this team. It is really good stuff. We are really excited for you guys to keep seeing it. So hit us up on those socials, subscribe. But till next time, till after this twin series, appreciate Joe for standing in for Sammy here. But for Joe, for Pat, for Sammy somewhere else, it's Gordo here for Play Tessie episode 69. Thanks for tuning in. Toodaloo.